Yeah, we feel very spoiled. Don't get often get visitors like you in the East Bay, so but I think we'll be getting them more often now. Um, finally, last but not least, one of the evidences of the Lit uh, San Leandro success. This is all about business attraction, retention, and expansion, right? So we have the next speaker here is Steve Scales, who's a partner at Power Factors, a tenant of the Lit San Leandro Dark Fiber Opt Dark fiber optic network. Power Factors provides performance analytics and operation services to 20, 20 solar power plant owners, including three large ones in California, and this is kind of random, 17 in Italy. Collecting data from hundreds of thousands of data points per second, 24 hours a day. So Steve, would love to invite you up here to say a few things, and maybe you could let us know why Lit San Leandro's Fast Fiber was a critical factor in your decision to move here. Well, thank you, Debbie. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, well, having grown up in Silicon Valley, uh, born at Stanford and pretty much seen what used to be a bunch of orchards kind of transform into what it is today, um, it was an interesting journey to end up in San Leandro because I had spent all my time down in the South Bay and really didn't understand the history of San Leandro as an industrial complex and all the rich history that it had. Um, it's really a pleasure to be in San Leandro um, for obvious reasons I'll talk about in a second, but as much as anything, it reminds me a lot of, of what California is to be. It's, um, or I guess still is in some ways, but it's a collection of really innovative, nice people um, with a lot of services and a lot of creativity around really generating value. And that's really what I saw as you know, California grew up from the 60s to where it is today. Um, in particular, what we do is we pull um, a lot of data off of solar power plants, um, put it through a series of analytics, and because it's a fairly static asset compared to a traditional fossil plant, it's less obvious where you lose efficiencies um, and revenue. So what we do is um, we take the data and run it through our analytics and then provide input back to the owners to increase their, um, their revenue and uh, overall economics. So, you know, consistent with the realities of data and um, the global economy, we have uh, power plants that my partner Steve Hannawalt was familiar with when he used to work at SunPower in Italy. So we pull that data from Italy through Canada and then into our servers and run analytics off of that. Um, we also, there's only three of us right now. We have a couple other contractors, so it's a fairly small company, but one of our partners lives in uh, Alaska. So, you know, having a very big pipe of data makes uh, inter interaction um, with video conference and sharing documents on the box, box.com, things like that. You know, it really is a manifestation of what a lot of people have thought about when they think of a distributed workforce and the ability to um, collaborate as if you were in the same office. Um, you know, in short, you know, I was a um, student at Cal. Um, the, the whole incubator concept and collaboration, you know, all that is really based off the quality and consistency of your data. So, you know, Pat Kennedy and Lit San Leandro, you know, if you don't have the fundamental infrastructure under, underlying what you're trying to achieve, um, it really doesn't work. So for us, San Leandro, for all those reasons, uh, was just a great, great spot for us to come and uh, really couldn't be happier. You know, I've worked in a lot of different big cities and San Leandro um, definitely has my vote. So, <laughs> thanks. So, I'm willing to rest on our laurels. This is, in fact, the journey just begins. So, just to give you a little bit of a timeline, Liz San Leandro, the first building was let, OSI Soft, in March of last year. Uh, in, in November of this year, we, or October, we got a, 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 the e, a Economic Development Agency approved a $2.1 million grant that's extending the fiber optic loop out another eight miles. 
We've uh, connected almost 100,000 square feet of commercial office space to date in that very short time. And we have almost a million in the pipeline right now, including an amazing space. How many of you know there's an incredible industrial space above Westgate? Shopping. Okay, we're lighting that up in the next 60 days. So the opportunity there to really create a scalable uh, industrial, advanced manufacturing, scalable from startup to uh, actual implementation is amazing there. So the jobs are coming, it's, everything is definitely coming. Now, I don't know how many of you, almost, how many of you have internet connection in your home? who Comcast and AT&T who do a good job in providing service. You're trying to download things, maybe six megabits per second. If you're Comcast, maybe it's as much as 10. And they will provide you up to that kind of speed. If you're trying to upload the, into the internet, it's a little bit slower. We're going to give you a demonstration just relative to that. So know that where, where you're at probably in your home, six, maybe 10 megabits when you're trying to download something. We're about to give you a demonstration of how fast this fiber is. And remember, you're running a lot of stuff off of it right now. So this is going to be the unused. This is the unused. So I'm moving off to the side, and you can take a look at it. <laughs> Sweet. So that's uploading. The first number was downloading. So picture yourself downloading a video off the internet and you get that little swirly thingy that happens. You're like, oh, dang, now but you're not going to get a swirly thingy with this kind of fiber. So right now we're not talking about fiber to the home today. I'm sure down the road those opportunities will happen. Right now what we're talking about is commercial economic development, attracting businesses, retaining businesses, creating jobs here in San Leandro. So this is the opportunity and so glad that all of you are here today to see the demonstration and hear the story. So I'm going to turn it back over to Mayor Cassidy right now. Thank you, Deborah. It's my pleasure to introduce Chairman Janikowski. He was sworn in as the FCC Communications Chairman in June 2009. He has focused the agency on unleashing the opportunities of wired and wireless broadband, pursuing policies to promote investment and job creation, drive innovation, foster competition, and empower consumers. Under Chairman Janikowski's leadership, the FCC has been a model for excellence in government, named the most improved agency in the federal government and one of Wired Magazine's top seven disruptors. Prior to his FCC appointment, Chairman Janikowski spent more than a decade working in technology and media industries as an executive, investor, and board member. He was the Chief of Business Operations and General Counsel at AIC Interactive Corporation, Special Advisor at the private equity firm General Atlantic, and co-founder of the technology incubator Lunchbox Digital. It's my pleasure to welcome Chairman Janikowski to San Leandro. Well, thank you, Mayor Cassidy, and uh, thank you to all of uh, you who have uh, spoken today. Uh, what a wonderful demonstration of what super high-speed internet can deliver for a community. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. This is a model for the country, and I think what I'll try to do uh, is provide a little bit of a national perspective and talk about how what's happening here fits into our national economy uh, our global competitiveness. Uh, uh, it's, of course, great to be here uh, uh, in the Bay Area, the heart of what uh, uh, analysts and uh, uh, others call the information communications technology or ICT sector. I've taken to calling it the broadband economy because that moniker captures the central role that wired and wireless high-speed internet plays in growing our economy and expanding opportunity. It's an incredible time in the broadband economy. Now, in the 21st century economy, 
economic leadership equals innovation leadership. No one knows that better than the Bay Area here. And broadband, as you've heard some specific examples of, is our main national platform for innovation. In today's global economy, talent and capital can flow anywhere, and more and more talent and capital are going to wired and wireless-based, broadband-based products and services. So we're in a global bandwidth race. We need, the U.S. needs a strategic bandwidth advantage. We need it because capital and talent will flow to the countries that have that advantage. I see this uh, regularly when I meet with my counterparts in other countries. It's actually not our little secret that high-speed internet is a platform for job creation, product creation, business creation, opportunity, as well as education reform and healthcare reform. Uh, it's not a secret. The rest of the world knows it. And very talented people around the world wake up every day and think about how in the 21st century can they be a magnet for innovators and innovation. So we're in a global bandwidth race. We need the U.S. does a strategic bandwidth advantage. And I'm convinced that an important part of that advantage is super fast, high capacity, ubiquity, ubiquitous broadband networks. Now, there's a lot of good news with respect to how the U.S. is doing against the need for that strategic bandwidth advantage. Uh, on the mobile side, to start there, mobile internet, high-speed internet, mobile broadband, the U.S. in the last few years has regained global leadership. We fell behind when it came to 3G. We fell behind when it came to mobile innovation. If we had gotten together four years ago and talked about mobile, we might have said, oh, mobile innovation is a huge opportunity. Uh, looks like it's all happening in South Korea and Japan. Uh, we might have said, oh, you know, 3G looks like it's the infrastructure, the mobile infrastructure of the future, except Europe is way ahead of us. Uh, well, today it's a different world. When it comes to mobile innovation, the U.S. is the envy of the world. When you think about new devices, operating systems on the devices, apps on the devices, uh, the U.S. is by far the global leader. Here's, here's a metric. The percentage of global mobile devices that have American-made operating systems in the last four years has gone from 20% to 80%. And around the world, usage of apps is predominantly American apps, Facebook and Twitter and Google and a lot of other apps that you all know. Obviously, in many, many countries, there are important, successful indigenous applications. But this world that I'm describing, very different from the world four years ago. And now let's take uh, mobile infrastructure, uh, 4G LTE. 4G, of course, is the, the, the next generation of mobile standards. Some of you may already have uh, LTE smartphones or tablets. LTE is uh, 10 times faster than 3G. The U.S. is leading the world in 4G LTE deployment. We have more subscribers in the U.S. than the rest of the world combined. The U.S. is the global testbed for 4G products and services, and that's a big deal. Now, on the wired side, we've had good news in the last four years, too. The percentage of Americans who live in areas where they have access to 100 megabit networks, Four years ago was 20%. I can remember these because they're all 2080 rules. So four years ago, 20% of Americans lived in areas with networks capable of 100 megabits. Today, that's over 80%. That's a big change in four years. Uh, on the investment side, even in the very difficult economy of the last four years, we've seen massive investment in broadband infrastructure. Uh, on both the wired side, it took a lot of investment to take uh, wired net networks to the speed increases that we've talked about. On the wireless side, even more. So from 2009 to 2012, investment in wireless networks is up more than 40 percent. 